I'm here at one of the most visited places in all of Miami, Ocean Drive. I'm surrounded by exclusive shops, boutiques, art galleries, and high-end restaurants. People travel from all over the world to visit. It's also a favorite destination for the locals here to spend an afternoon just a few feet from the waters of South Beach. It definitely has the allure and personality many people use as the backdrop for their social media posts. You've probably scrolled past some of the familiar sites that you'll find here. For as nice as it is to hang out and people watch, this is not a place you can come to find much peace and quiet. Truthfully today, it seems we're finding it increasingly difficult to find any peace and quiet. It doesn't really matter if you live in a large city like Miami. The noise of the digital devices we've grown so accustomed to and seem absorbed in most of the time are making it harder and harder to find silence. Would you agree that we find ourselves drowning in noise? So many voices, so many opinions, people increasingly divided among every kind of fault line imaginable. And yet in our noise filled lives, everyone is looking for direction, a clear path, a voice of wisdom, a way forward in our world where chaos, violence and hopelessness seem to be increasing. Have you ever wondered if God is still speaking today like he did in the past? Are you familiar with the story of Moses and how he led the people of Israel out of Egypt? You may have seen the movie. The Bible describes how God brought plagues upon the Egyptians until Pharaoh finally let them go. They didn't get very far before he had seller's remorse and came after them. God opened up the Red Sea so the Israelites could cross on dry land and with the Egyptian army in hot pursuit, just as the people of Israel made it to the other side, God caused the sea to close up again, destroying the Egyptian army and delivering his people. Through all time, the people of God were in the desert as they moved toward the promised land. God led them in a special way. He covered them with what the Bible describes as a pillar of cloud. Can you imagine that? Being in the desert and having cool shade covering them as they went? The pillar not only provided protection, it was one of the ways God used to lead them through the desert. There was no GPS. No one had Google Maps to rely on. God used a cloud to protect them as well as lead them. But again, what about us? I mean, it's nice to read these Old Testament stories and be inspired by them. But have you ever longed for a special revelation from God for you, for today? There are several passages in the Bible that promise us exactly that. Check out Amos chapter three, verse seven. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. Did you get that? God will never make a move without revealing it to his prophets. And who does the Bible say those are? The book of Joel talks about the end of time as we know it. And I'm convinced we are living in the last days of earth's history. It says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Did you hear that? God promises to reveal his will to prophets all the way to the end of days, young and old, men and women, visions and dreams, exactly the divine guidance we can trust to lead us forward. The last book of the Bible known as the revelation of Jesus Christ literally pulls back the curtain so we can see everything that's going on behind the scenes. Disciples of Jesus are not afraid as we face the uncertain future. We literally know how this story ends. In chapter 19, verse 10, John the author is so overwhelmed by what God has shown him through an, through an angelic messenger that he falls down and begins to worship the angel. And the angel says, see that you do not do that. 
I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Notice what the angel says, I'm one of you and we have something in common. All of us have the testimony of Jesus and that testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, many people become confused when you begin talking about prophecy and revelation, but I assure you, you don't need to be confused at all. If we take the time, we can be granted access into this understanding that John is getting from God through the angel while on the island of Patmos. Across from me on the other side of this channel is Fisher Island. It's a barrier island right off of South Beach, right here at Point Park. On most days, you can see the cruise liner sail out right through here. It's the wealthiest zip code in the US. The average income of the people who live on this 216 acre island is 2.2 million. Guess what? You can't just jump on the ferry to go there. You need special access. You need access to get onto this exclusive island. God in the Bible is granting you and I the same special access he gave John. In order to understand the unique way he is leading us today, Jesus grants us full access. So what is the testimony of Jesus which the angel says is the spirit of prophecy? Dwight Nelson, pastor of the Pioneer Memorial Church at Andrews University has said that Jesus' most compelling testimony was loudly proclaimed when he hung on the cross of Calvary. He puts it this way, God is not someone to be afraid of, but someone to be a friend of. The testimony of Jesus, his entire life and ministry, can be clearly heard in that singular moment, hanging between two thieves, proclaiming with his life and death that God is a God of love. He is someone you can trust. He is someone who's willing to go to any lengths to be reunited with you. Now the Bible records that Jesus cried out in a loud voice twice while on the cross. The Greek word used to describe it is megale, where we get our word for megaphone. Jesus is literally shouting with his last act of strength, yelling out his testimony. Eli Eli lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Literally, why have you left me all alone? It's the only place in all the Bible where Jesus asks why. In that moment, Jesus endured eternal separation from God. Did you know that Jesus' words while on the cross are nearly a perfect repetition of the prophecy about the Messiah in Psalm 22? Jesus is literally quoting it. Listen to the verses one and two. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear, and in the night season, and I'm not silent. Here we get a glimpse of what Jesus is going through as he suffers. Infinitely more emotional and spiritual pain than physical pain. He continues quoting, I was cast upon you from your birth, from my mother's womb, you have been my God. The phrase, you have been my God, is pronounced Eli Ata. It means you have been my God. But if you don't hear it clearly, it might sound like Eliata. And if you said Eliata, you would be saying Elijah come. Do you remember when Jesus was on the cross and those around him said he's calling for Elijah? It's entirely possible that Jesus was praying through Psalm 22 as he hung there and those surrounding him misheard Eli Ata, Eli Ata, and they thought he was calling Elijah. The prophecy in Psalm 22 describes exactly how Jesus would die. It's one of the most compelling prophecies about the sufferings of the Messiah in the Old Testament, and it describes how he was surrounded by those who would threaten him. It describes how they would pierce his hands and feet. 
dividing up his garments and casting lots over his clothing, it says he would be thirsty, how God would be far from him during this time, that this salvation would be for the entire world. And finally, it ends with this. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born, that he has done this. This final phrase, that he has done this, can be translated, it is finished. The prophetic psalm begins with the cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you left me all alone? And it ends with the last cry of Jesus, it is finished. Jesus is shouting, he is screaming his testimony, and he's reciting prophecy that he's literally fulfilling. That God is love. Can you hear it? Jesus entered the valley of death itself, so we would only have to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. If you've ever felt abandoned and alone, you're in good company. If you've ever cried out asking, why me? If you've ever been betrayed by those closest to you, those who were supposed to be trustworthy, if you've ever been falsely accused, misunderstood or slandered, you have in Jesus a Savior who has also suffered in like manner. If you've endured physical, mental, and emotional abuse, you have in Jesus a Savior who was willing to step in, suffer and die the death you and I deserved. Also, we would have no doubt of his prophetic testimony. The testimony of Jesus is that God is love. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So how is the testimony of Jesus the spirit of prophecy? The spirit that fills and inspires true biblical prophets will always align with the Bible's prophecies about Jesus who proclaims that God is love. A true biblical prophet will always agree with the word of God. Isaiah 8 verse 20 says, To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Jesus warned us about false prophets. Matthew 7 verse 15 and 16 says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Lastly, every true prophet will point to Jesus as 1 John 4 verse 3 says, But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. Here the Bible is giving us how the spirit of true Bible prophecy is manifest. It always agrees with the Word of God. By their fruit we shall know them, and they will always point to Jesus as the greatest revealer and embodiment of God's love. As Jesus hung on the cross, shouting his testimony, quoting prophecy fulfilled in himself, the suffering Messiah, he closed the loop. He helped us to understand that his testimony, that God is love, and the Holy Spirit, which is the power that fills God's holy prophets, remembering God will never do anything without revealing it to his servants, the prophets. All of this is in perfect agreement. But here's an important question. Did the disciples of Jesus understand all of this as they saw him die? You know, I wish I could have been there for the greatest Bible study of prophecy ever given by Jesus himself shared with two disciples on the road to Emmaus after his death. Jesus joins these disheartened and defeated disciples and listen to how the Bible describes this in the book of Luke. Then he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. All prophecy points to Jesus. He is always the focus of prophecy. When we get this, the result is overwhelming joy. When they arrived at Emmaus, 
Jesus broke bread with them and then revealed himself to them and disappeared from their sight. These disciples ran all the way back to Jerusalem to share the good news that Jesus had risen from the dead. So is God still speaking through prophets today? You can be certain of it because Joel chapter 2 promises he does and will. Has God supernaturally led the Seventh-day Adventist movement with the spirit of prophecy? It's hard to imagine the success of this movement happening by chance. I mean, we're talking about a church with over 21 million members globally, the largest Protestant educational and health system in the world, 92,000 churches, nearly 10,000 schools from elementary to university level, clinics, hospitals, media centers, publishing houses, and ADRA, the Global Relief Agency. All of this evidence of God blessing His church. Yet this seems the most unlikely outcome considering our beginning. In the middle of the 19th century, the Millerite movement endured the great disappointment when their belief that Jesus would return on October 22, 1844 did not come to pass. These sincere believers were left deeply discouraged, but were certain their studies of the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation had not been in vain. The longest time prophecy in the Bible, the 2300 days of Daniel 8.14, did in fact end in 1844. The Bible predicted this disappointment in Revelation 10 verse 10 and 11, where the angel instructed John to eat the little book understood as the book of Daniel. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. You see, the hope of the soon coming of Jesus was sweet, but that turned to bitterness and was followed by a command to prophesy again to all the world. But how? Where would encouragement come from? God began to give visions to a young 17-year-old girl named Ellen Harmon, who'd later become Ellen White, confirming God, in fact, was leading this movement. George Knight, an Adventist church historian, documents this vision. In December 1844, Ellen was praying with four other women in the house of a Mrs. Haynes in Portland, Maine. And Ellen writes, While we were praying, the power of God came upon me as I had never felt it before. I seemed to be rising higher and higher, far above the dark world. I turned to look for the Advent people, but could not find them. When a voice said to me, Look a little higher. At this, I raised my eyes and saw a straight and narrow path cast up high above the world. On this path, the Advent people were traveling to the city, which was at the farther end of the path. They had a bright light set up behind them at the beginning of the path, which an angel told me was the midnight cry, that is, the preaching of the October 22nd date as the fulfillment of Daniel 8.14. This light shone all along the path and gave light for their feet so that they might not stumble if they kept their eyes fixed on Jesus who was just before them leading them to the city they were safe it's interesting that Ellen's first vision was a confirmation that the October 22nd movement had not been a mistake on the contrary it was a fulfillment of prophecy and it was a bright light. Additionally, the vision indicated Jesus would continue to lead them, but they needed to keep their eyes fixed on Jesus as he led them into the future. What a powerful synchronicity with the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, always pointing people to Jesus and continually proclaiming that God is Lord. Ellen White was an unlikely candidate for the task God chose her for. Educated only till the age of nine due to an accident that left her debilitated and disfigured. 
Yet, the Ellen White estate records that during her lifetime, she wrote more than 5,000 periodical articles and 40 books, but today, including compilations from her 50,000 pages of manuscript, more than 100 titles are available in English. From the time she was 17 years old until she died 70 years later, God gave her approximately 2,000 visions and dreams. The visions varied in length from less than a minute to nearly four hours. The knowledge and counsel received through these revelations she wrote out to be shared with others. She's also the most translated woman writer in the entire history of literature and the most translated American author of either gender. What kind of life did she live? She was a faithful mother, wife, itinerant preacher, and a global missionary. God used her in many supernatural ways to establish most of our universities and hospitals. She had a good sense of humor, enjoyed the outdoors, and worked tirelessly to point people to the Bible, the Word of God, and to Jesus. I'd like to end by inviting my good friend Joseph who I had the privilege of baptizing into the Seventh-day Adventist movement several years ago to share his story of how God rescued him from the nightlife like the one on South Beach. Here he is in his own words. Ever since I was a child, I always wanted to be a rock star. I always wanted to be, to be in, the night, in the limelight. I became a professional DJ, I became a music producer where my music was getting played all over the world. I was, I was playing at different clubs. I, I was living that jet, jet set lifestyle, I would say. And uh, as I was living that lifestyle, like, I noticed that there was an emptiness. There was a, a, a dark feeling that what I was doing was not right. So one, my mom had bought me a Bible when I was, uh, when I was really young and, and I never opened that Bible. Like that Bible probably was collecting dust in my, in my dresser. And, and one day I just decided to open it and I decided to open it like, like I felt like something like opened my heart. Like, like something was, 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 was that, that, that tug that I had. I decided, you know, I, I need to find a church. So, so I started, I went back to Google again. And then when I went back to Google, like I found this Seventh-day Adventist church that I belong to now, which is called The Rise. And, and I, when I showed up to the place, I came, I, I looked for the, I, I was like, can I see your, your priest? Can I see your pastor? I didn't even know what they were called before. So I, so I was like, can I see your priest, your pastor? And like, oh, he's over there. And I, when I went up to him, I told him, hey man, I need to get baptized. And he looked at me with his face like, what? I'm, I'm like, I need to get baptized. So as we started talking, like we started meeting up at Starbucks and started like, like just talking and becoming friends. And he started teaching me like the, the biblical truths about, about, about the Seventh-day Adventist faith. I, um, I got baptized and as I got baptized, uh, once I got baptized, I, I just, like my whole world transformed itself in, in, into where, where there was peace, where, there was, where, 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 where God was just manifesting himself in my life more and more. There's there's like a there's like a situation going on with Ellen White that that, that 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 at times like I'm not like extremely versed in her because I didn't grow up Seventh Day Adventist but but I've met people that that that, that are, know Ellen White and some people love her and some people really dislike her and, and, but the thing is I don't understand why I, I don't really I, I'm still confused into the why they they, they dislike her because like. Some people try to put her above the Bible. And then some people try to say that she's completely against the Bible. When, when in fact, like, all she does is manifest God's love in all her writings. Christ's love in all her writings. Look, I, I really love the way she starts Patriots and par Prophets and the way she ends the great controversy. She starts with God's love and ends it with God's love. So, so, so she's, she's, she's like, just letting us all know, like, 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 bang, look, guys, God is love and he loves you and he wants to be with you. And, 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 and the way I, like, I, I actually started with a great controversy. Like, I don't recommend you guys starting with a great controversy. I recommend you, I recommend you guys starting with Steps to Christ. Like, like, I guarantee you that reading that book, your relationship with Christ is going to completely change. And, and I've been, like, 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 reading her, like, for quite some time now. And, and I use her 
I use her writings sort of like a like as a she, like I feel like she has like a veil where she opens up and she shows me things that I may not be understanding here. I'm not saying that the Bible doesn't explain itself. It's just that at times there's things that I'm looking at where I'm reading the Bible and I'm like, how did this happen? And then I go to her writings and her writings like sort of like unpack things that make that may not seem like reading it once or twice. My, my life has my life has been is that is that like every single day of my life I I, I try to I try to to delve into the Word of God where I spent like a lot of hours just studying but the reason why I study is because I want to share the truths that I'm studying with other people because the, the, the world at this present moment has a God has been grossly misrepresented in this world and, 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 and my mission is to show people who the true God of the universe is by showing them the love of Christ This message mean to you personally, in your heart, in your soul, in your faith journey? So for me, the, this message of the spirit of prophecy is, is really encouraging because um, it gives me certainty, it gives me assurance that, that God is leading us into the future as well as leading us in the past. Um, you know, the more, the more that I've read Ellen White, the more impacted I've been personally with how Christ-centered she is, uh, how she just continues to point every single one of us back to the Bible. You know, she always said that she was the lesser light leading us to the greater light. And so that's what I found in my, in my study of her and in my, in my reading of her. It's, it's so Christ-centered. It's so Bible-focused. And so I do find some things in her writings that, that uh, give us some, some background detail in Scripture. Um, and, and it's always just nurturing. It always just emphasizes that that the scriptures are right so that's what I would say that that as as we look at the beginning of this movement uh, there's no question in my mind that God supernaturally has led us to where we are today you know this this is a global church and and the way that God has blessed it in you know every fee, every sphere the educational you know the medical uh, the publishing work the media every every single thing about what God has done in this movement has his fingerprints all over it and so it's, it's just been encouraging to me to to be able to to work on this project what would you say to someone who grew up with a negative view of ellen white i think that anybody who has a negative view of ellen white hasn't read ellen white i think the majority of the people that i've come across what what they're suffering from is what others have said about what she has said and there's no greater antidote to that than actually reading you know steps to christ for example is one of the most powerful books ever written on how to come to faith in christ it's so simple yet yet it's profound like like i have studied that book for the majority of my lifetime and i continue to discover just powerful concepts in there desire of ages Another incredible work uh, that she wrote that, that if somebody were to read that cover to cover, your love for Jesus will increase incredibly. And the same could be said about the Great Controversy. The Great Controversy, you know, just describes some, some really dramatic events of, of, you know, Earth's last scenes as, as this world comes to an end. And when we take all of these together, and that's when we're really going to see the, the, the balance that God blessed Ellen with. Um, again, just so, so, so Christ-centered, incredibly gracious, merciful, uplifting, and inspiring. So uh, people that have had a negative experience with Ellen have most likely uh, had a negative experience with what people, others, have said about her. And my greatest encouragement is to not listen to them. Go read her for yourself, and your faith will certainly grow. So it's important to understand that Ellen 
always claim to be the lesser light pointing us to the greater light, which is the word of God. And so I think it's essential for us to understand the role of the spirit of prophecy, specifically as we see it in, in uh, Ellen G. White, that every single thing that she said and did pointed us to the study of the Bible. She led us deeper to, towards Jesus Christ, closer to Jesus Christ. And so if we continue to maintain that that is who she is and that's what she is here for, that's the blessing that God gave, it, gave her to us for, then I think we'll have a balanced understanding of her writings. And so every single thing that she said, every single thing that she did pointed us to the greater light. If we study, if we spend time digging deeply into the word of God, God will reveal the truth of his word to us in a way that's profound. Somebody may ask, you know, what's the difference between uh, God speaking to specifically a prophet like Ellen White, which she wasn't exclusively a prophet. She was so much more than that. And say, you know, sister so-and-so in the church that God reveals something to her. Um, maybe uh, one way to understand this is the scope. So God chooses the scope of our influence. And God chose to use the scope of this one servant in a really, really broad and powerful way. And so God continues to speak to us. We need to remain open. We need to remain with very spiritually attentive to what other movements God is bringing about in speaking to us and leading us. And again, the tests of a true prophet will remain the same. Are they in line with Scripture? Do they agree with Scripture? Do they lead us closer to Christ? And so I think that there's safety in that, and I think that the inspiration of, of being open to this is, is, is just incredible.